Hello, my name is Marcus. I'm the compiler of a collection of therapy quotes entitled 1001 Windmills of the Mind, a collection of quotes taken from what's often called a psychodynamic or the psychoanalytic perspective, which long ago, as I understand it, was referred to by some as philosophical medicine, because this perspective seeks to so-called metabolize or accept something that happened to us when we were children but at that early stage the child's ego isn't developed so they can't perceive they can't handle or manage uh, if something that's overwhelming for their psyche but it's recorded it's, it goes into their implicit pre-verbal visual memory system it's in their memories leading to psychic pain unconscious pain uh, there's fantasies around that pain in the event and the events that they can't perceive, that they don't know about. Um, that can lead to what's called unconscious motivation or unconscious will, depending on the severity of the trauma for the child. There's this innate drive for healing. So the child theory is, as explained in recent videos, uh, so just briefly again, the theory is there's this drive for healing. So because the child believes, doesn't believe in time, doesn't understand time. If they're traumatized and the unconscious is, mo is sort of the puppet master, so to speak, it can get the person to live in the present, uh, trying to recreate the past to see if they can get a, a new past. It can't be done, it's a secondary delusion. There is time. So if, if we're not aware of it, we're going to repeat uh, to see if we can get our memory. We're going to repeat to see if we can get our memory, our narrative truth, hence our feelings, hence our identity. Russell says the trauma uh, basically is that the child lost the safety with the mother. When they lose the safety, they lose their feelings. If they lose their feelings, uh, they lose their identity because general consensus is, I feel, therefore I am. So we repeat, because Russell says, because we're looking for memory and feeling. Once we have memory and feeling, we stop repeating. So the psychoanalytic perspective is to get some of this personal narrative truth and our feeling so we can stop repeating. Repeating, it's like Sisyphus, it's dysfunctional, doing the same thing over and over again like a broken record, living in the past. The present is a constant new addition of the past, they're stuck in the past and they're replaying the past and the present. Again, Edmund Berger's metaphor, every neurotic is a music enthusiast, but he only has one record, one of those long playing LP vinyl music disc records, and he carries this one music record with him, that's the only record he has, although he loves music, he only has one record, every time he sees a record player, a new situation meaning, he spins off that old repetitive record, and he's stuck like that playing the same old childhood traumatic script, so on that record is the traumatic script, so the psychoanalytic perspective, another way of saying it is, we want to unpick the threads of a traumatic script, use those threads to weave a new healthier script. At the beginning of the series, uh, I used the Carl Menninger's uh, basic quote, uh, something he said to a client, he said to, he said to somebody, you know, your dysfunctional behavior, your emotional eating, your fear of happiness, choosing the wrong partners, etc., and all these other complaints and problems that you're talking about, we may say that this is what your script is doing to you. But let us see what we can do with that script. So that's not bad. We want to change the script, update the script. Now the script, it's hard because it's, it's based on the attachment to the mother. The script is designed to preserve the attachment to the mother. So there's a law by Fairbairn, uh, as well, a, law, a, a belief, a theory, that very few people would maybe argue. Uh, as, as summarized by Fairbairn, life force is object seeking. The moment the baby comes out of the womb, he's looking for the breast. He's not looking for pleasure. He's not looking for uh, entertainment. He's looking for the, he wants to bond to his mother. He, he expects to latch onto his mother. Humans come out of the womb too early, so they want an extended womb, meaning they want an extended mother. They want their mother to continue the womb life, so they're looking for the psychological egg, the extended womb, called the stage of social symbiosis, the stage of undifferentiation. 
baby doesn't know where he ends and his mother begins. The stage of fusion. The mother is a self-object for the baby. The mother is a symbiotic object for the baby, meeting the baby's symbiotic needs. It's called the maternal holding environment. The, the baby is looking, expecting this maternal holding environment from their mother. So life force is object seeking. That term object, object just means any person or anything that's emotionally important to you, that you attach to. So the child's first object is the breast mother after birth. Right? So if there's trauma, and the child has to cling to the mother, and there's a problem in there, he's still clinging, waiting for her to change her way so he can feel safe enough to know himself and differentiate. So the dysfunction is to preserve the loyalty to the mother, because he can't let go of the mother yet. The baby can only let go of the mother if he receives her love. If the mother's unavailable, impinging, refusing, uh, misattuned, malattuned, these kinds of shaming activities, the child needs her even more. So he's more attached to her, he's more bonded to her, he's more clinging and desperate for her unavailable love because the more unavailable her love is the more he needs her love so the more he clings the more he's stuck the more he's attached okay, to preserve that attachment he's got to find some compromise uh, that preserves the attachment uh, and still gives him hope that the mother is somehow connecting to him so the child comes up with something dysfunctional uh, so if the child thinks food is mother he may be a binge eater or emotional eater thinking that that's a connection to his mother in his unconscious fantasy. Right. So the basic idea is that the child is one with the mother after birth for the first three to seven months. With enough love, he gradually differentiates from her. D difference. He knows that he's different from his mother. There's difference. That's, that's healthy. That's uh, development. So differences for delight, because when he differenti when he differentiates, he has delight. He he has a wide range of emotions. He has aliveness of affect, a wide range of affect, needed affect, appropriate affect. If he wants to feel delight, he can feel pleasure. If he wants to feel joy, the serene, inexhaustible fullness of being, he can do that with differentiation. If he needs to mourn losses later on, he can do that. He can feel the necessary, appropriate emotions related to a loss. He can feel as needed as appropriate so that comes with differentiation so the child has to differentiate from his mother not just cognitively but um, he's not supposed to be psychically married to her that's called the mother complex if it's a daughter that's called the, the electric complex and so on so the child has to feel like he's a person in his own right with a psychological self the mother is a person feelings and needs and she has a psychological self and she's a separate person you know so that sense of um, I'm a person you're a person and uh, understanding that we have feelings and needs and we understand that you have feelings and needs and we understand that so I'm okay you're okay we understand each other we're, we're uh, all the same you know, that way so there that's the thou thou that's the I'm okay you're okay mindset that's normal natural healthy development that kind of mutuality, mutual uh, care, understanding. So people are calmer that way. But they're not projecting uh, the frightening, they're not projecting some image of the rejecting mother onto the other and then hating the other. Uh, you see, if the child doesn't differentiate, it means he didn't get the love. That means the mother was shaming. The child is gonna create an image of his mother as shaming him. Now this image, is depicted in myths and fairy tales as the devouring monster that wants to eat the child. One book is called So the Witch Won't Eat Me. Why? Partly because of projection. Projection means that the baby can't accept something. It's, it's too much for him. It's overwhelming for him. He's gonna selectively have disattention about himself and make up some selective attention about the other, called projection. So if the baby's enraged, I'd be at the shame. Remember shame, the emotion of shame is symbolized in myths and fairy tales as that burning, biting feeling. Now that burning, biting feeling in myths and fairy tales, that's the hell scene, the infernal scene, the fire, the hot, the burning, biting. That's a symbol, a metaphor for the emotion of shame. Myths and fairy tales are metaphors for internal dynamics. Myths and fairy tales describe a traumatized psyche. They're true on the inside. 
This is fairy tales that are like dreams, they're soul stories. So they're, we're talking about something depicting the invisible inner world of, of unconscious motivations, repressed feelings, and the coping mechanisms the child adopts. So uh, if the baby wants mother's love to feel safe, to have development, and he's not getting it, he's enraged, he can't accept that feeling of being enraged. So he thinks that the mother, the object, is enraged. That helps him to not face that him feeling rage, which he can't accept, is not within him. So the child uses a maneuver of the mind, an operation of the mind, a mechanism of the mind to help him or her not feel that massive anxiety of him being enraged. He can't feel it. His little system can't do it. He can scream and cry, I guess, uh, to a degree, but he's terrified. He thinks he's going to be abandoned. He's going to perish. What kind of mother would do that, he's thinking. Oh, if we have some uh, guests here, I might have to move here. Hold on a sec. No, that's the waitress. Hello there. How are you? Yeah, good. Okay. <laughs> oh. Hopefully she's not uh, directing some customers here. So <laughs> That's okay. This venue, I found a good time. This is late afternoon. This is Sunday afternoon around... What is it here? Let's see. 424. So this is a good time. Not many people are here. Should we do a quick little tour? Uh, I've showed you in other videos, but we can always I can just do a brief one here. So I'm on the I'm on the 28th floor. Let's see, I've never looked that way, have we? I'm on the 28th floor. of a hotel little little city park there yeah filled with people just sitting around yeah yeah Sunday is uh, rel relatively quieter here I notice on Sundays but uh, I'm on the 28th floor of this uh, hotel and uh, they have this nice little sort of restaurant lounge area here and uh, I've done the past, I guess this is my fifth, possibly my sixth video here. I've lost count. But uh, this has been a great venue. You know, part of, the, part of this venue is this nice little bird here. <laughs> I'm not sure why. It's a fake parrot. But, um, but I, I find some unconscious uh, comfort by the presence of an imaginary bird there. Should we, should we finish the tour here? Okay, let's do a quick little walk through here. Yeah, nobody here. Look at that. Well, that's amazing. Usually this area is packed with people, yeah. I've been living in the countryside for the past six, seven years, so maybe that's why I'm feeling a sort of novelty of being back in a big, busy city. Something to do with dopamine. When you see something new, the brain sends you dopamine. We won't get into that topic, but... Uh, but for more information upon, on dopamine, serotonin, and oxytocin, check out Loretta Bruning's trilogy on the topic. Her three books are Meet Your Happy Chemicals, I, Mammal, and Beyond Cynicism. Those are very short, easy to read uh, booklets. Um, you could probably read the three books in one or two days. It's an easy read.
And all I gotta do is buy a coffee. There's my coffee there. <laughs> That's a great deal, yeah. Um, so, um, back to that uh, theory about why the child creates an image of his mother as being a devouring monster that wants to eat him. Okay, so the rage, he thinks the mother's enraged. Now the mother's this giantess in the nursery from the baby's small perspective and how important she is now and how helpless the baby is. So there's some sense that the mother, the breast mother is this very grand sized. Uh, everything's exaggerated with the baby. So this giantess in the nursery is enraged. Now the baby has a need to take in, incorporate, interject, absorb in, feel, take in the loving maternal motherly presence and her motherlinessness and her warmth and her acceptance. The mother needs, the baby needs to take in these things and along with the milk and the comfort and the soothing and the feeling that mother accepts the child and welcomes the child. The baby needs to take all of this in. So that's a need. Now, if the child has this need and he's being shamed, he's afraid to know his need. Now, his need gets repressed. So just like his feeling of rage got repressed and then projected, his need to take in is projected onto the devouring monster who now wants to eat him, okay, take him in. Right? So. Uh, Riding Hood, right? And uh, Hansel and Gretel, all these witches. Yeah. So that's to so in the dream world and the, un in the so the fairy tale mythological world is the same as the dream world. It's primary process thinking. Things are very condensed. Things are simple. It's jam packed, and things can flip around. Um, so the image of the cyclops eating the people—that's the breast eating the people. That's a symbol or metaphor to communicate that the child can't accept his fear and rage at the breast and his need to take in, and now the breast is taking in, but he wants to take in. He's projecting onto the breast, things like that. So it's flipped around, it's, it's, that's, it's a different language, right? We live in two worlds, this unconscious world and our, our intrapsychic world and our interpersonal world. So object relations theory is the study of the internalization of interpersonal relationships. So the baby has an interpersonal relationship with his mother. He, it, he creates a map of it within called intrapsychic world, or it looks like a theater in there. It looks like a myth or a fairy tale, especially if it's traumatized. And we go into uh, the theory about the main psychological patterns uh, in myths and fairy tales, and why myths and fairy tales are metaphors for, for uh, traumatized psyche. So that's one of our e-booklets, by the way, The Psychology and Interpretation of Myths and Fairy Tales. We do the Arestia, we do the Odyssey, uh, some of the tales described by Chinon, uh, Demeter, Narcissus, Pierre Gint, and a few others. Although Pierre Gint is literature, uh, we include that one. It's similar to Narcissus. So, uh, and a few others, yeah. So if the child in his mind has an image of his mother as a devouring monster that wants to eat him, what does he do? How does he relate to his mother if he were to accept that? So even that, even though he denies rage, he denies his needs, puts it onto his mother, that's not enough? He's still afraid of the mother? What does he still do? How does he even just feed and nurse? How does he just stay alive, right? He is a genius in a way, I guess you could say. He found some desperate maneuver of the mind called, let's make up an, a perfect breast, a heavenly, divine, supreme breast. And let's imagine that that's his mother. He creates two mothers in effect. The true mother, which he denies, and an imaginary goddess mother, goddess breast, right? that he accepts, but it's fake, and he accepts it. And that's how he, while he's with his mother, he fantasizes he's with somebody else, and that's how he feeds safely. It's a trick, the baby is a genius to figure out that little trick, so he can nurse uh, in the context of him 
believing that he's relating to a monster that wants to eat him, which is which is forgivable, because he's got to do because he doesn't know what to do with his rage and his needs, so he projects them uh, onto the only object there, his mother. So what what does he then do? Well, he can't even face that, so he's got a, another operation. He's got to manufacture a made-up mother and think that he's relating to that. That's called splitting. Uh, and he keeps them apart. He when he's related to the goddess breast. He denies uh, that the devouring monster is a part of his mother. He thinks that's someone else. He, th he thinks they're separate people. Right? He doesn't get it. He has no emotional uh, connection between the two. He thinks they're like two different people. It's not true. The mother's one person. The mother, the reality is she's mostly frustrating and partly satisfied. But the child uses splitting in the cases where the mother is more frustrating than loving. That's the key. If the mother's more loving than frustrating, that's good enough. The baby can handle the two sides. He can handle the ambivalence of the mother. So that's the prototype or the ideology of having the ability to see two sides of a situation. The child can see the two sides when he has the strength of the love first, knowing that the love outweighed the frustration. Now he can, okay, he has the foundation of having been loved. He can accept that the mother sometimes misattuned, but he can handle that ambivalence, right? And he may feel a little odd about it because he wouldn't want to get angry, too angry at the one, at the one who loves him and who he loves, but who sometimes misattuned. So there's a little bit of ambivalence there, and he can hold that ambivalence. So he can accept ambivalence, seeing the two sides. Right? Klein's jargon for this is the depressive position, because he'd feel bad if you if you were to hurt the one you love. So it doesn't mean you're depressed. It's just a jargon. That's another thread, Melanie Klein's theory about the positions, so I won't go into it. That's a huge topic. Oh my, that's a huge topic. And one of the real losses that I that I experienced this summer, I'm still trying to get over it, um, come to terms with it, is that I lost 17 videos mysteriously. And these were my, these were the best, that was, I was on a roll, that was my best material. And, um, over 50 hours of commentary got, the quotes got saved, so that's okay. We have saved the quotes, they're all there. But over 50 hours of commentary describing Melanie Klein's positions, a lot of, a lot of time and work was done on that. Uh, that got lost, as well as a lot of excellent other material. Now I'm in the process of trying to rebuild and recoup work. Uh, so, 1001 Movements of the Mind uh, uh, is, is building and um, writing new quotes. We now have 2,250 quotes to the collection. That's pretty good. They cover 50 topics or chapters or e-booklets or themes. Okay. And um, Actually, the entire file of 1001 Windows of the Mind has another 2,000 plus quotes in the sort of honorable mention. There are good quotes uh, but what I'm doing is I'm trying to basically pick out the best of the best, give, give them a TQ designation, call them a therapy quote. Um, and so we now have uh, over 2,000 therapy quotes, plus another 2,000 plus quotes that are pretty good quotes, and they're all in the collection. So 1,001 Windmills of the Might, in other words, ha has over 5,000 quotes. Um, it's eclectic. Uh, I feel they're. I feel that uh, they're uh, in the spirit of philosophical medicine, hope and help for the soul, basically. Because the jargon, the words, the speculations, the hypotheses, the questions, the models, the jargon, they move towards acceptance. They move towards accepting. Knowledge, understanding, accepting leads to forgiveness. Forgiveness helps to build the love side. We want the love side to outweigh the shame side. The forgiveness helps to do that. Once it, we do that, okay, again, at midlife, man's main task is to forgive. So that means he's going to differentiate, i.e., give himself psychological birth. Again, man's main task is to give psychological birth to himself. So we all have the biological birth. 30% of the children in North America get a psychological birth. 
by one estimate, at the age of three, with a secure attachment style, but roughly 70% of the children in North America, by one estimate, are not getting a secure attachment style. So at midlife, their task, according to this man's main task, is to give psychological birth to himself. It's his life. He knows not his fault. The mother didn't properly love the child. But it's his job to understand what happened. It's his life to forgive her so he can give psychological birth to himself. Right. So, um, you know, the last video we covered quite a bit of material. But uh, in this video here, hold on a sec. Let me uh, get back. Uh, let's get back today's. Uh, hold on a sec. Okay, we're back here. We covered a wealth of material in the last video. That wasn't a bad video. Um, I, I was very distracted throughout it. It was done here in this venue, um, but I, I watched it through and it wasn't so bad. I, that's not a bad video. It covered a lot of topics. In this video, it's just gonna be one TQ quote. Uh, I've taken some sentences from a guy named Otto Kernberg. We don't have many of his quotes, um, mainly because in the past when I tried to read him, oh wow, he just loves his jargon and he's just filled with... Uh, I feel he's, he's being kind of defensive. I get a counter transference reading him. I think he's very guarded and resisted. And that makes the reader feel bored, kind of thing, right? When a person's very guarded like that, I think he hides. I think he loves his jargon and his long, convoluted sentences with, filled with jargon. I think he maybe takes a little certain pride in it. So I, I've kind of avoided his work. But now that I'm more comfortable with the jargon, uh, I took a peek back at his work. So um, TQ twenty one fifty. It's basically uh, just some basic ideas uh, around uh, the therapy process, all from Kernberg and his colleagues. So I'll just run through them here. Basically, it's just some definitions, some basic ideas. So this uh, video may not be that, uh, might, might not be that sort of ended. Maybe it's more on the this is informative, necessary side. It's more on the information side rather than on the more lighthearted side. The last video I thought maybe might have been more on the, slightly more on the fun side, especially the last quote uh, at the end of that video, TQ2149, the, the variety one where people chose which quotes they liked. Okay, so Kernberg says, ideally, ideally, the client or the person seeking therapy will give some indication of wanting not only change, but wanting to change. So yes, they want change, but do they want to do the work of change? Are they motivated to do the work? Do you see that kind of, that they want to do the work to change? Remember a lot of people go to therapy, they just want to feel better. Katie Lee's, Katie Lee's song, uh, Shrink Her Band, talks about this. She says, shrink her man, shrink her man. Just give me one of your cut rate cures. Uh, just make it easy. Just say abracadabra, make me feel better, cure me. So she doesn't want, she wants to change, but she doesn't want to change. She doesn't want to do the work of change. Uh, so by the way, that's a fun, that's a fun, um, there's some fun music by Katie Lee, L-E-E. -E. Uh, her album is called Songs of couch and consultation uh, her most famous song her big hit is called it must be something psychological I noticed that uh, there's a commercial uh, there's a perfume commercial or something that uses that song uh, in the commercial 
So that's her big hit. It must be something psychological. I won't go into it here. Shrinker Man's another one. Uh, Properly Loved is another one. A couple of other good songs. She's got uh, the repressed hostility blues, another one, I think. So anyways, um, so Kronberg says here, is the person motivated to change, not just want to feel better? If they just want to feel better, okay, they're not ready to do the so-called psychoanalytic uh, conscious work of trying to make a link between their problems in life when it happened in their childhood development and then, uh, and then witnessing an example of it in the here and now, how the here and now stems from the there and then. And that's why in the here and now he's doing it because of the there and the then. And that's why, so, that, so that's how he uh, can make it, be conscious of how he's transferring, displacing, repeating, projecting something in the past and the present to see if he can change the past. That's his function. So that's the psychoanalytic side of it. Right? If the person doesn't want to think about that, or oh, that's too convoluted or something, just wants to feel better, uh, then he goes to the so-called supportive counselor, giving advice there, there, now, that kind of thing. Sometimes people start off on the supportive side and say, this is not helpful. I want to change. I want to, I don't just want to, I don't want to pacify it. I don't want to deny it. It's called spiritual bypassing. They want to get better. And they go to the analytic approach, right? So ideally, the client should give some indication of wanting not only change, but to change, as well as some basic capacity to profit from learning from new experiences. Keep in mind that life goals are not necessarily uh, legitimate, quote, therapy goals. So that's a new phrase, I like that. So we all know about life goals, you wanna get a promotion, or you wanna get married, or you wanna lose weight, or um, you wanna you know, run the mile in under a two minutes, or whatever it is. You know. So people have certain maybe life goals, or retirement plan, I don't know, what life goals, right? But therapy goals are different. Therapy goals are, you want to mourn the loss. You experience the loss, you didn't acknowledge it, you're in shock denial, you feel like there's something wrong, you feel blocked, and you can't go on with your life, you can't love again. That song, Learn to Love Again, well, that'd be a good song to play, Learn to Love Again. Unfortunately, I don't have Wi-Fi here. You know, maybe at the end, I'll see if I can dig up the Wi-Fi here. Maybe I can play it. I'll hit the pause button and see if I can do it. In the last video, we talked about the trumpet, and I, I said I'll look for a song for today. I looked around, I didn't really find any songs about the trumpet. Uh, I thought about playing the saxophone in uh, the logical song by Super Tramp. So I'll just leave it for now. So therapy goals might be the person who wants to differentiate, know himself, achieve his psychological growth, go on the second journey of midlife, find his psychological birth, find himself, know himself. So he wants to have that sense of who he is. Maybe he's afraid to be alone, so his therapy goal is to be comfortable with himself being alone. If he knows that he blames a lot and he wants to take responsibility for his projections, own his projections. Right? If, he's, uh, if he has extreme opinions, over idealization and over devaluation very quickly, if he's impulsive, what's well, a therapy goal? He wants to heal some of that. Right? If he wants to be more three dimensional, not so two dimensional, that's a therapy goal. Um, if he wants to, if he senses that. He's repeating the past and the present. That's a therapy goal, to not be Sisyphus, right? to turn a new leaf. He wants to turn a new leaf in life. That's a therapy goal, right? And he wants to make that conscious change. 
and he would be able to do it if he understood why he's stuck repeating the past and the present. And he wants to understand it so he can make the change. So he's motivated. So he's, he's at that place of midlife. Usually people are at midlife, they get that motivation. It's called the second journey of midlife. Um, other therapy goals might be, maybe he says, I want to feel more. Maybe he says he feels flat. Maybe a person says he dissociates a lot, he daydreams too much, he's dreaming his life. He feels like he's living a provisional life, when does life begin kind of thing. Maybe he feels he wants to feel more present. He wants to heal trauma maybe, let's say. He's got PTSD, he wants to heal his... So those are maybe some examples of therapy goals. Now life goals uh, are not therapy goals. So the person has to have some kind of therapy goal. Some, something, something to start with. It might not be perfectly clear at the beginning. He says he feels stuck or maybe he feels he's not able to trust anyone. Maybe he has a negative attitude all the time with people. Maybe people keep telling him to lighten up. Maybe he wants to face his uh, chronic uh, melancholia or something, chronic sorrow. And maybe he has pathological nostalgia. Maybe he can't grow up. Maybe he says he's a Peter Pan. I, I, just, I, just, I can't be a Peter Pan. I, I've got to grow up here. Uh, so those would be therapy goals. What about the guy who says, well, I have to have therapy because if I don't do it, the wife will leave me. Uh, that's a tough one, right? Um, much of that. I think, um, uh, anyways, never mind. Okay, so that's the first one there, right? So the client, if he's going to do therapy, if he's going to do uh, s s uh, psychoanalytic therapy, if he's going to go on the second journey, he's got to indicate that he's willing to do the work. He's motivated, right? He, he, his, his, he has basic IQ, so he can understand uh, if, he has, uh, if he gets some new insights, he can benefit from it. Um, right? and, uh, that, that's a tricky one because a lot of people, there's there often there's what's called negative therapeutic reaction. A person gets an insight, they should get better, but then he temporarily gets scared and he, and he regresses. So he doesn't improve when you think he should. That's because the therapist didn't catch a deeper unconscious guilt, yeah? a deeper... Uh, tight symbiosis with the rejecting mother. He missed that. Maybe he underestimated how symbiotically trapped he is in the tar pit of a negative symbiosis with the image of the frightening mother in the mind. And it's very tight there. Huh? Uh, because what Burglar makes a point, you know, he says an interesting thing. The life, life force is object seeking, that's pleasurable. Of course, the baby's gonna be happy to feel safe and bonded to his mother, that's pleasurable. What if the mother's rejecting? But the mother, but the baby has to attach. So the baby has to send out his pleasurable attachment needs. In reply, the mother's rejecting. Bergner calls this blurring of the two, the pleasure in displeasure phenomena, or the libidinalization of pain. Sometimes it calls it guilt, the libidinalization of guilt. He calls that phenomena psychic, his jargon is psychic masochism. That's very hard to kind of grasp that. And it's, it's hard to be aware of it, so the compromise is we'll do something dysfunctional and think that the dysfunctional activity is why we're unsatisfied in life. So that's, um, that's a misleading defense. Underneath the misleading defense is the deeper, true leading defense. So it's layered like, so Burglar emphasizes this layering thing. So negative therapeutic reaction is the, the therapist missed something. So the client's willing to learn, but maybe the therapist didn't catch it. So I'm, I'm a little unclear about this, about that second part here. Okay, next one here. Okay, regarding free association. When one talks freely about what comes to mind, the important issues tend to emerge naturally. 
Thus, regardless of whether what comes to mind seems important or trivial, it will help in the long run if you go ahead and talk about it. So if you feel safe with somebody and you start talking, things that are important will emerge. Grief is healed when it's witnessed by a caring other. The person wants to be seen and witnessed. He wants that chance. If the therapist is safe, it's going to come up. So all the, all the client has to do is just talk. Just, just say freely what comes to mind. And, and important material will come up. And don't discount something trivial because it can then lead to something important. Right? It's the bridge. Right? Okay, transferences. Okay, transferences are unconscious repetitions. Transferences are unconscious repetitions in the here and now of past internalized object relations from the there and then. Okay. So the baby, the mother, and the nursery, that's the there and then. We superimpose that, we transfer that into the here and now with someone else in the present. Okay. That's called transference, or transferring, displacing, like a transfer, like you're Like you're on one bus, you get a transfer ticket, you transfer it to another bus. The first bus was the there and then, you transfer it to the here and now. You, 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 you re, you're replaying the past and the present, it's called transference, right? Okay, again, transferences are repetitions, okay? Doing in the here and now, repeating something from the past there and then. So in the there and then, usually the baby had a wish, the mother was misattuned, the baby felt afraid of his wishes, he felt shame. Now in the present, he's gonna transfer that relationship in the present and expect it, maybe even coax it to see if he can master it. So he may expect the therapist to be shaming and coax him to be shaming and believe and speak to him in a way that he's shaming, having his deep belief that he is gonna shame him and be prepared for it, and he's stuck with that transference. And the therapist has to interpret it in what's called a transference interpretation. For example, a quote, you react to me in this way because you see in me your mother's attitude in your past. Okay, again, quote, you react to me, this, you react to me the way you're doing because you see in me your mother and her attitude, unquote. Now this uh, may be responded to by the client as though the therapist had said instead, quote, it is terrible that having had such a mother, you now have a therapist exactly like her. That's, that's a pretty good that was, that's a pretty good one there of understanding transference. So the therapist gives a transference interpretation. He might as well just say to, to, to the reader of the book teaching transference. He might the therapist might as well say to the client, "Geez, yeah, it's terrible having had such a mother that you did, and you now have a therapist just like her. Wow." That's, that's transference. It's parataxic distortion. He's distorting. He's displacing. He's transferring. He's projecting. Why? When something's painful, he projects it. When something's repressed, he projects it. It's in the past, he brings it to the present. It's projection, right? Now, when he projects, when he transfers, it then gets rationalized. He, he makes an excuse about it. He wants to make it sound reasonable. Okay? So transferences are often rationalized by the client as, quote, realistic reactions to their outward selective attention and inward selective disattention, or sometimes called parataxic distortion, externalization, projection, repetition, compulsion, etc. Transference, a repetition of reactions originating in the client's past and unconsciously displaced onto the therapist. So that's a good summary of it right there, right? Transference, it is a repetition of reactions, reactions 
What happened at the nursery? Okay, in the past, what reactions from the past, and then transferring it to the therapist in the present. And then he may coax the therapist to play the role of the refusing mother and expects it. So this is a very common phenomenon, right? In that song, it must be something psychological by Katie Lee. Great song, by the way, yeah. She says, the mother was unavailable, emotionally unavailable, unattainable. She then chooses partners who are emotionally unavailable. It's not logical, it's psychological. She's trying to master the trauma of when she was a child that her mother was emotionally unavailable. So she chooses unavailable, emotionally unavailable people, wants them to be unavailable, coaxes them to be unavailable. Maybe she's difficult and passive aggressive to make them unavailable, to coax them to, to be unavailable. So that's familiar for her because she wants to master the past. We played that song by um, Devron, what's his name again? Zevron. Is it Zevron? Anyways, uh, he has a short song called uh, If You Won't Leave Me, I'll Find Somebody Who Will. That song, by the way, was written, was meant to be the, the theme song to the sequel to Route 66. Um, there's a great little song here. Uh, I've played it a couple of times, but maybe we can uh, play it again here quickly. So in th this is a similar idea. He says he's going to choose people who are going to leave him. Now, if, the, if he finds someone who's not going to leave him, he wants to push them away, and he'll find someone who will leave him, because he's trying to master the, the trauma of the mother abandoning him emotionally. He wants to choose emotionally unavailable people to try to master that childhood scene. So he's replaying, transferring, displacing, paratoxic distortion of the past, transferring the past, distorting the present to fit the past, to replay the past and the present to see if he can change the past. So the song is, if you won't leave me, I gotta find someone who will. So he wants to coax them to leave them. Right? So he won't accept love. Because he's stuck trying to master the pain of his mother unloving. Here's that song by uh, Zebon. That's, I think that's got to be the best TV show theme song ever. That's a great theme song. Even though the show never really uh, got made. That was supposed to be the theme song to Route 66, the sequel to Route 66. That's a great show from the 60s, right? Uh, Todd and, what's his name? Buzz and Todd in the car. Uh, we have a few quotes from that show. Another, th another threat to 1001 Windmills of the Mind are excellent psychoanalytically minded quotes from movies and TV shows. We have uh, The Fugitive from the 60s show, The Fugitive, Judd for the Defense, the legal drama, Route 66, good one. Uh, it's and from movies. We've got a great collection of uh, TV and movie quotes. Warren, the, the, the guy's name is Warren Zevron. Again, I'm a refugee from the mansion on the hill. I'm a refugee. From... And if you won't leave me, I'll find somebody who will. Okay. <laughs> That's 
that song always puts a bit of a smile on me for some reason. He, he, he's, uh, he's gonna coax a loving woman away. He doesn't want acceptance. He doesn't, he can't accept it. It's, it, it's too triggering for him. He's not ready for love. He's still trying to master the pain of being abandoned by his mother. So he wants to coax. So projective identification is projecting an identity onto the other person, the partner. And then interacting with that person as if they had that identity. Yeah. Now to, in, the pro, in the process of that, you're coaxing them to demonstrate that, ident to prove they have that identity, and then say, see, I knew it. You're just like the mother. Yeah. So, um, he, this song explains that the same song, it must be something psychological. They're trying to master the trauma of having a mother who didn't offer a maternal holding environment, a secure attachment style. They're trying to master that trauma. When there's a threat, the baby lost his safety, it's a trauma. We're going to choose unsafe people, emotionally unsafe people, to try to see if we can get a better outcome with it. Travel back in a time machine. In our fantasy, morph the person to the nursery. It doesn't work. That's why it's like Sisyphus. So that's why it's called repetition propulsion. It doesn't work. Russell says a person can have 20 lifetimes choosing emotionally unavailable people. So the, the guy, so the woman in the song, it must be something psychological. She could have 20 lifetimes choosing playboys and never find love from them. It doesn't work. It won't, she won't master that trauma by repeating it, trying to still, it's, that's her positive intention, to master it. But ultimately, she's creating a mirror to know that repetition compulsion is synonymous with trauma. Her dysfunctional repetition compulsion, her transference, is for her to realize that she has trauma. Trauma is what's making her transference and repeat. So this dysfunctional behavior means trauma. Now she has a sense, aha, I've got trauma. Okay, now we've got to forgive the mother. To, to release, to be released, and move on. We have to forgive the mother. Because if you forgive the mother, then you can differentiate from her. Right? So, um, okay, back to uh, transference. Again, transferences are unconscious repetitions in the here and now of past, internalized, okay, it's in your brain in the form of unconscious fantasies, internal objects, imagos, images, it's inside relationships, okay. So you got a frightened, wounded child being terrorized by this devouring monster, by the cyclops or something. That's the image of the relationship the baby had with his mother. That's his representation, emotionally speaking. You see, that's, that's a pain there. That's why he's recreating the past to see if he can magically think that he has a new past and that therefore the old past doesn't bother him anymore. If he can get a new past, He's operating from the world of timelessness, so he thinks he doesn't understand time. So he, if he does it again, it's as if he undid what happened and had a new one instead, because there's no time. It's hard to explain a little bit, but it's sometimes called undoing, magical thinking. I, I think the, the best uh, ex explanation is a variation of repetition compulsion in its mildest form is if something bothers you, let's say at work something bothered you, you may go over it in your mind and see how you could have better handled it. It's not just, it's partly learning, but it's also partly to not feel so pained by it, to see if you can think about a better outcome. So repetition compulsion is a more dramatic uh, expression. Okay, um, that's a huge topic, transference. If you look in the search engine in this channel, uh, you'll find over 100 quotes on transference. Each quote just sort of adds a little bit to it. There is some overlap in jargon. Okay, the next, here, the next one here from Kernberg talks a little bit about interpretations. Another threat 
interpretations, what are they, how do we make them, uh, and so on. It is, okay, an interpretation. Okay, interpretations are verbal formulations of hypotheses regarding the assumed links between conscious behaviors and their unconscious determinants. Again, interpretations are verbal formulations, psychoanalytic formulations of hypotheses regarding the assumed links between what you're doing now, conscious in the here, in the present, in the here and now, what you're aware of, and when and where you learned it back in the there and then, but you forgot, meaning the unconscious determinants. Interpretations, okay, they seek to integrate, they, they integrate, they, they, and they utilize and integrate the information, any information that stemmed from any kind of clarification and confrontation that took place with the therapist. Sometimes the therapist seeks a clarification about something that can add information. Sometimes the client says, well, why would you do that? That's the so-called confrontation. And that's the information you get from these two can help toward a formulation, a hypothesis of what's going on. So the formulation usually is linking the pattern or the problem and the pattern in general to when it began in, de in childhood development, and then to see it here and now, live, an example of it live, to make this three links. The general pattern, what the so-called genetic, uh, the source of what, where the person learned it in childhood, and then to see it demonstrated live kind of thing. So that's a formulation, it's a hypothesis. Yesterday's video was about that, hypotheses, and we updated. Interpretation. Its aim is to, try to, is to try to resolve the conflictive nature of material by assuming underlying unconscious motives and defenses that, when understood, make previous apparent contradictions understandable or explainable, quote, for example, I think you have been trying to provoke me into an argument in order to protect yourself against the emergence of trust with me. Or another one is uh, acting tough. You're acting tough rather than giving in to your dependency needs, your wishes to get better. So one part of it wants to be vulnerable and trust too much, so as a reaction formation, he acts tough as a defense against it, sometimes called the machismo defense, the manic defense. It's all a bluster, a show, to use power and control so he doesn't have to feel his vulnerable needs, his dependency needs, that kind of thing. Interpret defensive aspects before content. Surface before depth. Okay, so defense before content, or surface before depth. Interpret defensive aspects before content. Interpretation needs to include the recognition that the client erects defenses, puts up defenses, uses defense mechanisms. Okay, that's a defensive aspect. Because, so you notice that, because of the need to protect yourself against the content, the depth, the feelings, the needs, the wishes that seem intolerable, forbidden, etc. So you do this because you're afraid to talk about this. You change the topic because you're afraid to go on with what you were about to talk about. So the defense is changing the topic. The content was you're afraid of the feelings that would come up were you to continue talking about it. So just to be aware that we had that when emotions come up, we can't handle it. We use a defense mechanism, a trick of the mind, a maneuver of the mind to get us to not feel what's important. Hence, we keep it repressed, hence denied. Hence, the projections to continue, the transference continues, the prejudice continues, the repetition compulsion continues, the unlived life continues, living 
replaying the childhood past and the present continues. So if we make the unconscious conscious, we can stop repeating. Again, if we can find our narrative story and our feelings, we stop repeating. The optimal, the best time to interpret the splitting defense is when the opposites actually come to oscillate within the same session. Kerber talks a lot about timing, that you gotta time it right and things. Now the splitting defense. If a person is still using the splitting defense, the splitting defense is meant to be existential hearsay by the age of three. If a person is still using it, that's a problem because splitting precludes differentiation. Splitting doesn't allow differentiation. Differentiation occurs when a person can see the two sides of the mother, when, he's eight, when the child is able to see the mother as both loving and frustrating and can handle the two, that the two are from the same one person. Then the person can differentiate. If the mother's too painful and the child creates two mothers, denies one, splits the other, idealizes one, that if he does the splitting thing, he can't see the, that means he can't see the two sides. The child has to see the two sides to feel safe enough. If he is able to see the two sides, it means he's feeling safe enough to know himself. So how does a therapist help? Again, my disclaimer, I'm not a therapist, I'm the compiler of the quotes. But as I understand the issue, how to, from this quote, like the inference I'm making from this quote is how does the therapist help a client, a person, to be aware that they're still using splitting? Well, maybe one moment, he says that his wife's an angel, goddess. Five minutes later, she says she's uh, something very devaluing. In the same session, goddess and demon ideas came out on the same person, and he may not be aware of that. So Kernberg's example of this is uh, with himself here. Okay, omnipotent control, projective identification, idealization, devaluation, and denial make it possible to sustain splitting and that the contradictions are of no emotional consequence. Quote, for example, right now, client, you're telling me I'm benevolent and you are totally relaxed with me. The client says, well, what's wrong with that? Therapist says, Kerberg says, well, I find it puzzling that 10 minutes ago, you said you had to watch me like a hawk, that I was dangerous. Quote, well, that's how you were back then. You're different now. Quote, how can we make sense out of my apparently changing so quickly? It's as if you know what to do with me only when you see me as at one extreme or the other. So that's two-dimensional thinking, right? When whole three-dimensional, better yet, four-dimensional, right? When three-dimensional internalized self and object representations have been formed, the client has entered uh, the more advanced phase of treatment. So the template, it's two different people. In the fairy tale, the goddess and the demon are two separate people. The wonderful fairy godmother and the wicked witch, they're, they're considered in the story as two different people. That's splitting. No, they're two sides of the mother. The mother is frustrating and disappointing. That's the wicked witch, witch side. The mother's loving sometimes. That's the good fairy godmother side. One mother is both, but in the fairy tale you see two separate characters, that's splitting. That's the main psychological pattern of myths and fairy tales, the motif of goddess and demon, that's the splitting. Selani explains it clearly. David Selani in his book, Fair Barron's uh, Object Relations Theory, very good book. On the front cover of that book, it's, it's uh, the babushka doll, right? The doll inside the doll and then another doll inside the doll. That's a very good book regarding object relations theory. Solani's uh, work there. The 
the child has to see that it's the same thing. So I think that that example, um, it's not perfect, but it's it sort of comes across, right? One minute the therapist was considered uh, totally untrustworthy. Next minute he's relaxed and at ease, and the client doesn't see that he projected the goddess and demon images onto him. The therapist was just a regular, ordinary guy. Okay, another example of projection, uh, sorry, interpretation, is this one here. The interpretation may be rejected for many reasons. One reason is because it may be used in some kind of uh, fantasy way or magical way. Quote, therapist says, every time I say something to you, you act as if I have given you some amazing gift. At the same time, by your responses, I can see that you never pay any attention to what I'm saying. All that seems to count is that I give you something, and yet what I give you seems to get lost immediately. So in other words, he was saying you know, some clients just want to recreate an illusion of fusion with the therapist. When the therapist is talking, the client is just in his fantasy with the fusion, the words become milk. They don't care about the words. He just hears words and he thinks he's being fed milk. So that's an interpretation of a very early on trauma at the nursing, where the person doesn't care so much about the content. If the therapist is talking nicely and smoothly, he may not even make sense or something. Sound familiar? Some people, some people talk, they don't make any sense. Someone like Jung, he's contradicting himself all the time with these grand, confusing, conflicting statements. What? Every sentence he's, he's said, you, you read from him, you go, what? What do you mean? But the person might think, uh, yeah, Jung is this uh, strong, seven foot, big, handsome guy. I, I don't know. A lot of women are uh, very uh, attracted to him, apparently because they think it's an illusion of fusion. If he's talking a lot, talking all the time in his books, women think, well, they're being fed. Um, but there's no value, really. There's nothing, really. I'm gonna, in the future, try to tackle this issue of this collective unconscious that he peddles. The psychoanalytic perspective says there's no such thing as an invisible group collective mind that's influencing people. And we have one quote from Martin, uh, recently presented in part, that talked about it. And the thing about Jung, uh, they said, one guy said was uh, that uh, he's speaking. Uh, in a way to create an illusion of fusion. So what he's saying is more like creeds. So people believe these dogmatic assertions to have a connection with this uh, tall, handsome guy, I guess. I don't know. Um, so women want an illusion of fusion, and Jung probably wants an illusion of fusion. So these are, um, you know, when two people fall in love, they don't care what they're saying, they're just Google-eyed with each other, oh, they're in that blissful state or something. They're recreating the symbiosis. But the psychoanalytic perspective is building the ego, building the consciousness. Uh, just like all of, these, all of these buildings, all of these buildings being built here, okay? So one metaphor for building consciousness or building the ego, it's like building, like a building here. We, we're building, we need cranes. We gotta build, add some uh, blocks and beams and we gotta build, right? So we have to be conscious. Well, there's not a bad little scene here, right here, right?
Oh, there's some birds. Subway. Nice penthouse apartment. Lucky guy up there. Actually, these are some nice uh, condos in here, eh? I won't try to look inside, of course, but uh, anyways. <laughs> So this quote here was about um, the client is not building his conscious. They're, they're not trying to be conscious or try to understand their inner conflicts. They're not trying to understand what's going on. She's just in goo goo, in this woo like feeling of being one with the therapist, and the therapist is talking, and the, the woman feels like she's being fed or fused. Uh, so she's recreating sort of that a similar phenomena that people engage in. Sometimes in religion, yeah. imagine power, uh, an ideal breast in the sky. You're one with it, and you feel good by it. You know, so some uh, therapists uh, maybe uh, mimic that. Uh, one theory is a lot of these characters, like Jung and Lacan, and a lot of other ones, uh, they're sort of in that mode. They're not really trying to help you to understand. They just want to make you. Lotus Land, Lotus Land in the Odyssey, gives the illusion of fusion. Just recreate Lotus Land, Lotus Land. There we go, right? Illusion of fusion, right? Staying one of the breast, not knowing the riddle to the Sphinx about development. That riddle is about development, understanding development, Rec accepting that we don't stay fused in Lotus Land with the mother. Right? So a lot of, um, I won't do the religion one here now, but we have a thread, a very good thread in 1001 Windmills of the Mind. One of the threads, booklets, is on the psychology of religion. That's a great topic, a very interesting, um, there's no disrespect to anybody engaged. And again, we said at the very beginning numerous times, we're talking more about, we're not talking about people who are victims of the plunder system. We're talking about how religion is used as a tool for the of the plunder system. So we're not we're not trying to take away any comfort. People who are victims of the plunder system get by it. Uh, they're in a tough situation, but we want to understand uh, the psychology of religion. Uh, maybe I can do it very briefly. Jeez, how are we doing? An hour and thirteen minutes here. So here's maybe a very brief, I'll try to do a brief sample of what I'm talking about. It all begins with Homo Boduensis. Let's see if we can find him here. Hold on a sec. Here we go. So I'm going to go on a tangent here a little bit. Hypotheses. Hypotheses. A guess. So what you're about to hear is a guess, a guess, a hypothesis. One hypothesis is that before we were us, Homo sapiens, we were this guy. Meet Homo Boduensis. We used to be him. Before we were us, we were him, called Homo Boduensis. Homo Boduensis ran around on the earth for roughly one million years. For one million years, we were him, running around, presumably, in uh, the African area somewhere, right? And um, all babies uh, got a secure attachment style. All babies were loved. Right? So uh, they were peaceful. Um, one million years, they got along, right? But the theory is, about 150,000 years ago, Homo boduensis developed a cortex. 
Okay, he developed a neocortex, the insula, the hippocampus. Now he's got language and memory. All right? I think I heard some. Hold on a sec. I might have to move here. If, uh... Oh, they left? Okay, good. They just paid a visit to the area. So the theory is that um, 150,000 years ago, Homo boduensis developed the neocortex, the insula. That's the part of the brain that lets us feel us, that feel that, that helps a person to feel their sense of self when they're loved, their identity. So they have language now, symbolization. They can write, and they can speak. So presumably Homo boduensis uh, didn't have language writing and all that. So we evolved from Homo duensis to Homo sapiens. Now in the beginning, Homo sapiens or Homo naturalis, Homo naturalis. So for 150, so 150,000 years ago, according to hypotheses, Homo sapiens, Homo naturalis came on the scene. All babies got a secure attachment style. All babies were loved, mothers were attuned, so the, the temperament of Homo sapiens was I'm okay, you're okay. There was no schadenfreude and sadism and iagos and cynicism and pessimism, all these negative, there, there weren't these types of things. Um, there was no, right? Uh, people got along uh, to deal with benign anxiety through song, dance and ritual. Um, at worst, there was some jealousy about relationships, partners, uh, but there was nothing over the top dramatic. There, there were no. Uh... Okay. So for 100,000 years ago, all babies got a secure attachment style. The temperament of Homo sapiens was the adult temperament, as we understand the adult temperament: warm, affectionate, calm, caring, understanding, patient, kind. All that we know about the adult temperament, the adult ego state. So they were normal sense of uh, being who they're meant to be when they're loved. Then, 10,000 years ago, the hypothesis continues, Homo naturalis became Homo economicus because 10,000 years ago, Homo sapiens discovered farming, agriculture. When that happened, a lot of people said, no, leave it alone. Don't, don't, mess with, don't mess with this, like just, just, the earth gives us plenty of food, uh, leave it alone. Uh, we can live in egal egalitarian setup, so we can be, uh, we can be nomads, nomads. We can all live like nomads, where I know I'm mad at you and you know I'm mad at me, says one comedian. So, th so they were not mad at each other back then. Most of them were nomads, they were not mad at each other. And they had a long life. They lived to be 150, someone said. Hypotheses again. So they were healthy, strong, uh, relaxed, confident people. The children were loved. The play was fun play. It was safe play. It was, sp it was, it was uh, spontaneous and creative. It was delightful. Uh, a lot of laughter, I, I imagine. Uh, a lot of... Uh... So the theory was... Uh, humans got along in egalitarian setups or in, uh, in cooperative uh, nomadic uh, arrangements. Then they discovered farming. Some people said, no, leave it alone. Those people apparently are now still around. First Nations, Indigenous, Aborigine, Mate, Inuit, uh, you know. Inuit, First Nations, Métis, Aborigines, all the, all the traditional indigenous people. They were, they're the ancestors of the ones that said, no, leave it alone. Cooperate with nature. They're, they were the ones that said, no, don't, don't do this, don't dig it up. But, some, but this was too exciting. We got, people were way too excited with the discovery of farming. Right? Hold on a sec.
my approximate guesstimate is that it would be like today. What if everybody suddenly won a trillion dollars? Wouldn't that be overwhelming and very stimulating? And what do we do? Wouldn't that be too much to reject if, every, if you won a, mil, a trillion dollars? So maybe it was like that. Maybe it was something in that area. When, when people discovered farming and agriculture, it was this huge bonus, like, wow. No one thought about the consequences, or maybe a few did. Yeah. Uh, so 10,000 years ago, The theory is people got a huge burst in serotonin into their system. The theory is when somebody gets something that the mammalian part of the brain interprets as giving the person safety and all that food is safety, the person gets serotonin. We habituated to this new, very high level of serotonin and adapted to it, I guess, I'm assuming, hypotheses. Now humans have this new set level or level of expectation of serotonin. Meaning, if you didn't get what gave you all that serotonin, you'd suddenly feel a lot of stress. So back to Brunning's books, her trilogy. Meet Your Happy Chemicals, I Mammal, and Beyond Cynicism. That's the reference for this part. So what if there was a weather problem back then? Well, who knows, people panicked. Now people started to hoard. Now we became homo economicus. Now we plundered and hoarded. Now that's against our nature. Our, na our nature is, I'm okay, you're okay. We don't want to treat people so cruelly, crudely and force them into being lab poor laborers and all this. But, but people panic and so we got to plunder. H how are you going to do it? Someone, I guess, got the idea. They call it, quote, suffer the children. They traumatize the babies by removing them from their mothers. That's a huge betrayal, a shock betra a sh uh, betrayal trauma, a shock trauma. Now when the baby's traumatized like that, they identify with the aggressor. Their shame self, they see onto others. That leads to the I'm okay mindset, you're not okay mindset. So they invented, they created the prejudiced personality through the shock trauma. Now the prejudiced personality, so before it was the tolerant personality in the global village, then it was the prejudiced personality in the global pillage. So the prejudiced personality was created. How do you create the prejudiced personality? You traumatize the babies. That's the, that's the splitting the us and them mentality. So you, you want babies to have the us and them mentality as the prejudiced personality. So they created the prejudiced personality. That's needed for the plunder. Okay, because one side's gonna get the others to do all the work. One author called it, uh, you need a pool of poorly paid workers to do, all the, to do all the work. So now we invented poverty. We created it to plunder. And we still see it today. Billions of people live on $60 a month, they said. Totally unnecessary, sad, sad... Uh, A sad phenomena of uh, all that human happiness and potential being traumatized like that in the delusion that we've got to keep plundering out of this panic from 10,000 years. Again, all hypotheses, right? Anyways, it's a working hypothesis. We'll update it as we get new information. So, again, the prejudiced personality was invented to create one side to go against another side, to create the us and them, so that you have a pool of poorly paid workers who does all the work. The results from that. So, children can, were can, continued to be traumatized at birth. They were treated very poorly. When homo naturalis became homo economicus, read Lloyd Demas, babies were treated very poorly. They're objectified, totally objectified, uh, in the panic to plunder, right? And create uh, administrators of the plunder system. Yeah, it's always a tough topic. I think I did a better job in previous videos. But, um, so, um, 
Why did we go off? Why did we go off on this tangent, anyways? Hold on a sec. Let me get back to the floor here. Oh, the splitting, right? So when the baby's traumatized, removed, removed from the mother at birth, they're gonna split. When the baby's traumatized, the mother's the devouring monster. They deny it. That's one mother. See, they can identify with it. The shame self, they see unto others. They do a negative magic gesture. They find some other people who are safe. They say, they're shame, they're no good, they're good. Meaning from the baby's point of view, the mother was good and they identify with the mother, then they think that they're good because they've identified with the mother. So they made up this fake belief that the mother was good, identify with that aggressor being fake good and take that fake good opinion of them and, and adopt it for themselves and that's their identity. So they say they're good. It's a fake good to not feel the truth that the true self is the hungry, enraged, empty part self, the shame self, which they see onto others, externalized. So that creates the prejudiced personality, the us and them. Right? So the splitting is needed. So trauma creates splitting. Splitting is needed for the us and them, the prejudiced personality, which was for the plunder system, based out of the panic of the fear of not getting what gave them the serotonin, maybe because there was a weather problem. And people got habituated by that time to all of this surplus um, that they got. You know, I forgot why we went on off on this tangent here. Um, well, I'll, up, I'll, I'll uh, see if I can get back to it uh, either by the end of this video or the next video. I think I was going somewhere with it, but I think I lost my train of thought. So we mentioned uh, Dreikers, uh, not Dreikers. What's his name again? Rudolf Dreikers, is it? Something like that. The educator from the 60s. Very famous uh, shrink from the 60s called uh, Rudolf Dreikers, I believe. He wrote, he, wrote a human, he, he wrote a humanity, humanist manifesto calling for a new deal, a new deal for everyone to be treated with mutual respect understanding, empathy. Uh, so that's the new deal that's needed, a, psych a psychological new deal where everyone is seen as people in their own right, wounded, Ubuntu. You find your humanness in each other's human, you find your humanity in each, you find hu your humanness in each other's humanity. Love your wounded neighbor with your woundedness. Um, everyone's fighting the toughest battle, be kind. Th those kinds of um, Ubuntu expressions um, we all we all use defense mechanisms. That's what we all have in common. These, this appreciation okay, that we're all that we all as babies created the numbers of the mind, and we're stuck there, and we don't know it. So there's the compassion that we're stuck in an existential net dilemma, and the goal is to be aware of it so we can loosen it use the threads of that traumatic script to weave a new healthier script. Meaning, forgive the mother, differentiate, find your psychological birth, and then you are comfortable uh, with yourself. And then you're, and then at late in life, you can be more of an elder. You, you can share what you learned and contribute and build. That's our natural state, right, to be elder be elders. Right? One, one person said, we need more elders in this world. All of these olders out there, we need some of them to become elders. And they can do it quickly because they do have a lot of knowledge. They have a lot of resources. A lot of olders now are very well, incredibly wealthy. Uh, they could, they, someone said in two years they could become an elder. Masterson said he had a guy in his 80s, and in a very quick time, he became an elder. You know. So we need more elders. You know. Robert Bly said, 
a lot of young people have never met an adult or let alone an elder. They don't know what it, they have no idea, concept of it. They have no concept of the adult mind or they never seen it, they said. Some, some uh, youth said they've never met an adult. Their teachers were just angry children, barking at them, all that kind of thing. Right? Punished by rewards, rewarded by punishments. What was it? Dreikers was talking about this. Dreikers says, he, yes, encourage the children and all that, but don't treat them like with the carrot and stick too much. That, that's too... Uh, Okay, let's do the last one here from Kernberg. Okay, this, uh, this last part here sort of uh, summarizes the overall second journey, I think maybe sort of partially summarizes the second journey of midlife. So here's the second journey in a nutshell. When the tolerance of ambivalence, okay, bring, seeing the mother, seeing the two sides of the mother as one human being, okay, tolerance to ambiguity, when the tolerance of ambivalence has been achieved, the client is able to see himself or herself as well as the therapist as a more complex human being and a new dimension of, of depth in the perception of self and others signals the transformation of part object relating into whole object relating. So this is Melanie Klein's term, part object relating. Oh, hi guys. Hi. Let me um, see if they pass by. Oh good, just pass by. So Melanie Klein's jargon is, is that the baby is engaged in part object relating. He doesn't, the baby doesn't see the mother as a whole person with her psycho psychological self. And she's a person in her, her own right with history and feelings. The baby just needs the breast and the, and the holding function of the mother. So he sees like a part of the mother. Remember people with a narcissistic pattern, they just see others as symbolic breasts. They don't see the person as a whole person with feelings and a soul. They just see them as in a utilitarian way. That's called part object relating. So he says, when we forgive the mother, see the two sides of her, we no longer, we move on from, we mourn the loss of not getting our early childhood needs met. Then we've developed, see the mother as a three-dimensional complex person. Partly loving, partly frustrating, having a history of ourselves, being trapped in her dilemma. Maybe, she, maybe she's suffering from intergenerational trauma. Maybe she's doing a negative magic gesture. Maybe she's a battle with the mother in her mind. She has her history. Maybe she's afraid to talk. So it's, it's, it's uh, a lot going on. So she has a psychological, she's, she's using defense mechanisms, um, that kind of thing. Right? So we appreciate the whole person. It's called whole object. So we want to move from part object relating based on splitting either or to whole object relating both and and we can face the ambivalence. Now at the same time, by the same token, the need to, the need to protect the self from intensely ambivalent relations with significant others by splitting mechanisms, projection, projective identification, acting out, decreases. Okay, so these babyhood maneuvers of the mind, we stop using them. In contrast to the earlier phase of treatment in which this intrapsychic experience has been often expressed in the form of acting out of behavior instead of subjective awareness. In the beginning, the person doesn't have subjective awareness. So he acts out as a defense against not being aware of his emotional life. Right? Thus, tolerance. So what are, we, what are we trying to say here? Tolerance for self-reflectiveness increases. Okay? So when we do the therapy work of forgiving the mother, okay, now we're getting some tolerance for self-reflectiveness. Now we can tolerate looking in the mirror and knowing ourselves. Okay, that's the second journey, the know thyself. The self-awareness movement, the know thyself movement. 
the self reparenting movement, the recovery movement, the emotional, spiritual hygiene movement, the second journey of midlife. The mythopoetic movement as well, right? Language, what else happens? Language, as when we start to heal, what else happens? Language begins to replace other behavior for communication of subjective experience. Okay, so we transfer action language, you're doing things to communicate what you can't say. Now you're using words for it. Now you're talking about it instead of doing it. So in other words, we don't have to translate the behavior into words. The person can directly jump to the words and not have to act it out. So if he says he feels like binge eats, if he says he feels like running to the uh, fridge, to the cupboard, instead of doing it, he can say he feels like, talks about it. So there's more language, less acting out. Before there's more acting out and less language, now it's the other way around, right? Okay, so acting out both within and outside of the sessions decreases and is replaced by increased verbalization. The client may describe a desired action. So he may say that he'd like to be passive aggressive instead of doing it. Oh yeah, I remember his example in the book. The woman likes to punish her husband by giving him the silent treatment. So instead of doing it, she talked about it. She said, you know, I feel like punishing you by giving you the silent treatment, by being passive aggressive, expressing my aggression passively. I want to talk about this. Instead of doing it, she wants to talk about it. So she had a marital council, uh, a family count, like a circle, a couple circle. People talk and understand each other, like a talking circle, talking stick circle, okay, family council group therapy, like, it's like a mini group therapy for the couple called making I statements together. That's when the relationship becomes like fine wine, when the two people talk to seek mutual understanding, mutual respect. So they're talking about it. The client demonstrates, the client demonstrates an increased capacity to predict behavior typical of the past. Quote, if I follow my usual pattern, I'll do this. So the woman might say, you know, if I follow my usual pattern and punish you by giving you the silent treatment, uh, this is gonna happen, that's the pattern. So I think that's what's gonna happen and then this is gonna happen and we're gonna repeat the past cycle in this. So she's able to talk about it by predicting what's gonna happen based on what happened in the past. Now, now as healing takes place, uh, Gratitude start, starts to enter into, into the psychological picture. They're grateful to do this work. They're grateful for this self-learning. Internalization of the therapist. Now there's a new object relations unit within. There's a unit within of representation of the self that is seen and accepted by a representation of the other. Now the other is the therapist, but there's now a psychic structure, a new relational unit inside. Not just, the, not just the units of shamed self, shame, rejecting mother. Loved self, if they comply uh, with mother's conditional love, saying, if you're regressed, then I'll take care of you. If you're autonomous, I'll punish you. Another relational unit of the child feels enticed and hoped by a promising mother, but that quickly switches over to the mother rejecting them and the child feels shame. Now there's a new relational unit. A new relational in the psychic structure. There's an image of the self that feels supported, seen and accepted by an image of the other, created by the relationship with the therapist. Okay? So object relations theory is the study of the internalization of interpersonal relationships. The person has an interpersonal relationship with the therapist. He wants to help and support the healing. They internalize that, now that's going on within. Now he feels supported within. In myths and fairy tales, that'd be like a guardian spirit animal supporting the person, that kind of thing. What else goes on during the therapy process? The client is a little more detailed uh, when they give explanations, right? Uh, there's new, uh, right? The memory is coming, they're more detailed. They're getting more memories. 
New information is coming up. Okay? Uh, secrets that were kept for a long time, they start to come up. Okay, new information. Grief is healed. Right? The client communicates more openly and honestly about areas that previously were too frightening to bring up. For example, he starts to talk about some of his fantasies. So in other words, there's now a collaborative relationship. A collaborative relationship. Sometimes called the therapeutic alliance, where the two people, the client and the therapist, are a team working together to help the client with his inner conflicts. So it's not a bad little quote there at the end. More verbalization, more communication, less acting out, seeing the two sides, three-dimensional, person can predict well if I do this the pattern is that that's probably gonna happen so let's pause about that the client is aware of punishing their partner with the silent treatment passive-aggressive behavior let's talk about all this instead she doesn't want to do it now she's internalizing the positive other the therapist now new, now new information is forthcoming the deeper stuff is coming up the secrets are coming up, right? Now they can talk about fantasies and realize that they're just fantasies, part of the psychic life. So this, uh, now there's a collaborative relationship. Once there's a collaborative relationship, uh, they, they grow quickly. The healing really accelerates. In the beginning, there's a lot of testing and that kind of thing. You know, what is it here? 5, uh, 5, uh, 54 p.m. here. It was my first time to uh, do a video during this time here, but I kind of like this. Uh... Yeah, it's nice here now, yeah. So this is from one of Otto Kern's, one of Otto Kernberg's book. One that he wrote with a few other of his uh, colleagues there. So it's Otto Kernberg et al. Regarding, um, he has a book about people who are very impulsive, either or thinking. It's the so-called BPD pattern. Actually, we don't have too much developed on the BPD pattern. That's still an undeveloped thread. The narcissistic pattern is quite well developed. Uh, the schizoid pattern, Iago, the unhealthy five on the Enneagram, that detached one. That, you know, good, because of good trip, that's a little bit developed. I'm yeah, just thinking about uh, which song to close up with. Hold on a sec. Gabriel, Dan McCafferty, Wong Fei, The Drifters. Okay, here's another cover too. So in the last video, we played a Gordon Lightfoot song. I'm not sure if we ever played this song. This is a, a cover song by Lightfoot. So Lightfoot has a song called Drifters. And this is one person's uh, cover of it. It's not bad. So maybe as maybe to have like a follow up to the last song. Uh, it's a fun song. It's called Talking in Your Sleep, 1971 by Gordon Lightfoot. Here's a cover of another one of Lightfoot's songs called uh, Drifters here. It's, it's hopefully the audio.
feels re real good to be stranded on my own. Here's a drifter. Well, not really. Free the yellow bird. Oh, that, that bird reminds me of the movie um, The Gods Must Be Crazy 4. His mission. Uh, Ixa, what's his name? Ixal? Shisal? I forgot it. The Bushman, the Kalahari Bushman. His mission was to free the yellow bird. Just, I just remembered that, yeah. Free the yellow bird. Yeah, yesterday we talked about, uh, there was one quote about movies, how we project something about ourselves that we don't know about and it's easy to do so when we watch movies so maybe if we watch a comedy film like that one the gods must be crazy for also known as uh, crazy Hong Kong uh, nothing uh, it, it, <laughs> it's a tribute to the, the franchise the gods must be crazy so he the Bushman what's his name again Ixao Shisao Ixao Ixao is that right I'm not sure how to pronounce his name a lovable uh, character, yeah. Um, so he's very innocent, right? He lived in a desert all of his life. Suddenly he's in Hong Kong. And he, and he had all of these uh, discoveries and wonders. And so he was very innocent and childlike in some ways. So we could see our innocence, our forgotten innocence onto him. So that's a fun little movie and an example of how we project parts of ourselves onto others. So we project a lot of our positive childlike traits onto Ixau. Yeah, free the, yeah, I remember that line. His mission to free the yellow bird. <laughs> um, so that's not a bad movie, right? I think that's my favorite sequel. Uh, that one, uh, the one, uh, the one in Hong Kong. Right? And you get to see the, the scenery of Hong Kong in that movie. That, 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 good acting. I was, I was, uh... Uh, uh, oh, the conclusion was hilarious. I, I, I loved the, the... Oh yeah, you wanna know a funny little thing about that movie. There's a good example of projective identification, I think. Ixau um, became friends uh, with a guy. Uh, the boss's assistant or something. Uh, very good actor, yeah, I thought he was. But because of the language misunderstandings, the buddy would just project, imagine what he would say if he were in his situation and then respond as if he had said it. So Ixal was saying whatever he was saying and the buddy would say, you don't say. Oh, your mother has a recipe for that? Is that true? Really? Oh, I agree with you. Really? He was... He was... Uh, um, injecting something that he would understand that he said and then, re and then reacting that way. So he was creating... I, I think it's an approximate example of projective identification. The buddy was giving... was putting... The buddy was imagining Ixau saying something that he would like so he could respond in a likable way. Because that's what he wanted, right? Something like that. So the, that's another topic, yeah? Projective identification. Okay, um, let's end up with a more uh, upbeat song here. Hold on a sec. That song was okay. Uh, the drifters there. I think I had enough of Gordon Lightfoot for a while. Let's uh, I don't think I've ever played Farron. Farron is a folk singer from the 70s. 
Let's play one of her songs. She's got a, a she's got a, a peppy song called "It Won't Take Long." Maybe it's a bit of a protest song kind of thing. Farron, underappreciated singer. Let's just play some good old classic rock and roll. Hold on a second. When you dream of liberty, must not yourselves with you. Top Benatar. Before you get the plea for freedom, you have agreed to be a rule. If the body stays a shackle, then the mind remains a shackle. Okay, let's play some classic rock here. Here's a song called Star by the band Streetheart. Just want to end up here on upbeat, sort of fun kind of song here. Underappreciated, a great song called Star by the band Streetheart. sec. You know, it seems my computer... Yeah, no, it... little tech issue there. Okay, that's okay, we'll leave it there. That, that was a part of the song, Star, by um, the, the, the rock band Streetheart. I think that's on their debut album, I believe. Under Heaven, Over Hell. Under Heaven, Over Hell. So let's have the ambivalence, let's not have the extremes. So, let's be both and, right? It's not either or, it's under heaven and over hell. It's, it's, that implies, the image implies sort of the spectrum and the range and holdings. That kind of. Okay, this has been TQ 2150, featuring Otto Kernberg and uh, his buddies there. A few definitions of terms, transference, a little bit on interpretation. Um, the idea that the client should be uh, should want to change, and uh, some of the accomplishments and achievements that take place as the therapy process is taking place. Right? And uh, there were a couple of there was one I think one pretty good example of an interpretation there. Uh, we'll see if we can have some. We'll, we'll probably add some more Kernberg quotes. He's around. He's uh, in his 90s at present. Uh, I'm wondering, he might be sort of the last of the Austrian shrinks you know, that came over in the, in the 40s or whatever. Edmund Burglar was one of the Austrian shrinks that came over. Edmund Burglar. Now this Dreikus guy also. Austria really produced a lot of Hungary, Austria, and Germany. They produced uh, what feels to me like 90% of psychoanalysis. They were really on it, weren't they? I mean, they were really uh, interested in this topic. Once again, there's no Freud in 1001 Windows of the Mind, simply because I can't read German. 
sadly. I equate the English tra I equate the English translations of Freud in a similar way. Uh, whoever it was that talked about the way Jung writes, it's a distortion. I once took a paragraph. Uh, twice I did. I took two paragraphs from different topics of the English translation and just took the original German and put it into Google Translate. Okay, yeah, they're really confusing people and put, taking people down red herrings and misleading people. I think the English translation is un, it's probably more unhelpful than help. I don't know. No, it's probably ultimately helpful because it piques people's curiosity to correct the nonsense of the translation. And, uh, Karen Horney uh, is good in uh, clarifying uh, Freud's uh, mistakes. Fair, op basically, object relations theory is sort of an advancement, a progress, an update uh, to the original psychoanalysis that was started. So maybe it was a uh, stepping stone to have convoluted English translation of Freud. But maybe the original German is what kept things going. Maybe the English translation was an attempt to uh, block the distribution of soul healing. Remember, the plunder system doesn't want people to be uh, tolerant and caring. The plunder system wants the prejudiced personality in order to plunder. The plunder system wants people to have an us versus them mentality. That's a traumatized mentality. The us them mentality is a, is a sign of the traumatized psyche, a very traumatized, abused psyche. The baby was severely abused if a person ends up with the us versus them mentality. Us equals them. We're all, we're all homo, we're all victims of the homo. Uh, we're all victims of the plunder system. We're not blaming anyone, we're just trying to understand why did the plunder system come about that created homo economist, the, uh, the prejudiced personality, and then all of the adjuncts to it. Religion is a tool of the plunder system because the purpose of religion is to promote splitting. Goddess and demon, goddess and demon, that promotes splitting. Keep people infantile with goddess and demon thinking. Feel better by imagining the breast in the sky. So that promotes and, can, and augments and, and preempts healing because healing would take place, but religion blocks it by getting you to indulge in the breast fantasy, illusion of fusion. Again, the gambit of religion is imagine the breast in the sky, you're one with it, it sees you, it knows you, it's all comforting. That might trigger the original memory of when you were at, when you were at the breast and got the Garden of Eden feeling, the Unico Mysticadu, uh, the Wakanda feeling, the Garden of Eden feeling, the oceanic oneness, the oceanic bliss feeling. So a person may experience now what they felt as a baby and, and call themselves a believer. That's all it is. Faber explains this gambit in TQ2118 and, and, the, and the videos and the three video, videos that followed it. So religion was a tool of the plunder system to prevent healing. Religion is there to promote the prejudiced personality. Right? Right? By promoting the story. Goddess and demon got two, pe two people. They're promoting the psychic structure of splitting. So, so if a child doesn't have splitting, if he was loved and he enters into re the religious thing, he may be confused. What is this goddess and demon thing? I don't get this. Are these separate? We have a quote where the kid did get a secure attachment style. He went to a school that was training children to be prejudiced. Jane Elliott says, if you graduate high school and you're not prejudiced, it's, it's a miracle. The school system promotes uh, prejudice, unfortunately. So that's another adjunct to the plunder system. Religion is there to promote the prejudiced personality. The schooling system promotes, maybe now it's a little better, but. Um, Listen to Jane Elliott, you'll get an idea about that. And we see it in the culture everywhere. The media is prejudiced. And, uh, P 
PR companies can be extremely highly prejudiced to promote as an adjunct of the plunder system, right? Promoting the us and them mentality. That's a, that's. Burglar says people in the PR advertising. He was talking about advertising, but PR I would think is the same. He says people in the advertising PR, that whole field. Um, he says these people have a real grudge against their mother, which whom they project onto the world. Now they're attacking the, the world. And they don't care about others because they're really trying to express their anger at the mother, but they project the mother outwardly and they're not aware of it. So in other words, yeah, there's a quote from Projector, he's, uh, from Edmund Burglar, he says that uh, PR people, uh, advertising people have a contempt for humanity. So you look at the advertisements, they're very uh, patronizing and infantilizing. And, uh, some of it's pretty... So yeah, check out the work of Edmund Burglar, one of our mentors. He wrote in English directly. So Edmund Burglar is the number one most prolific author of psychoanalysis direct into the English language. 24 books, 300 papers. Several of our threads are based on the work of Edmund Burglar. Negative Magic Gesture being one, Psychic Masochism being another one, and a couple of others. We talked about his book, The Psychology of Gambling, Fashion, Money. The, one of the earliest quotes we posted in 1001 Windmills of the Mind was a little zinger by Burglar, where he says, Cynicism gratifies infantile megalomania. See, cynicism, you're putting someone else down, putting yourself in the one up position that gratifies the original infantile megalomania that the person is taking refuge in. If the, person did, if the baby doesn't get love to differentiate, he takes refuge in that, that solipsistic. Uh, oh, that's okay. Hi there. Hi there. <laughs> it's a nice place, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Beautiful, yeah. Um, I guess I should start to wind down here. Yeah, in the last video, we talked about infantile megalomania. You know, a couple of videos ago, we talked about the narcissistic pattern. And, um, uh, yeah, can I refer you to a couple of videos ago when we talked about the narcissistic pattern regarding the ego ideal? ego ideal. If you watch that video, then Burglar's zinger about cynicism, how it gratifies infantile megalomania. So when people are cynical, they're, grat they're gratifying their narcissism. Right? Uh, trying to maintain uh, the oneness they have with themselves. But the other is them. They're still fused, or they want to be fused. And they're stuck there. They didn't differentiate. So cynicism is a symptom of a lack of differentiation. Because that's not, I'm okay, you're okay. Cynicism is, I'm okay, you're not okay. Right? Okay, two hours, four minutes, and uh, 30, nine seconds. Yeah, it's a different mood out here. It's a Sunday night. I was gonna, I was gonna play the the theme song to 1001 Windmills of the Mind, Ketcha Epstein's German rendition of the song Windmills of the Mind. Great song by uh, Ketcha Epstein. like to say a little more but um, I feel like maybe I should be moving on here mm -hmm. 
So we'll keep on building 1001 Minimums of the Mind, our consciousness, so that we can house our contents. See, that building is going to house people, right? House offices and... Yeah. Right? Maybe it's a condo or something. So these quotes are like little bricks so that we can house ourselves. We all live in a psychic house called the Soul Castle, Robert Bly says. It's Ithaca in the Odyssey. So Odysseus found Ithaca, his soul castle. Penelope was a symbol for his feelings, his feeling self. Narcissus didn't reach his, didn't find home. He ignored Echo. Pierre Gint ignored Solvig. But no, Odysseus, he went in search for his Penelope, right? He had some sense of it in the beginning. Or maybe he didn't, depending on the version. Arestia knew he had to differentiate. So the metaphor of Arestia is that he saw the two sides of the mother. That's the courtroom scene. Half said yes, half said no. That's the two sides. Athena, the judge, said yes, he saw the two sides. He can differentiate. So it was okay for him to differentiate because he saw the two sides. So that's a metaphor for differentiation. So arestia is not some external thing. Don't, don't think of it in some external way. It's a metaphor to describe how the boy separated from his mother. Now, when he tried to separate from his mother, it was scary for him. That's why we saw the Furies. The Furies represented his fear, his mother's anger at him leaving him. The mother wants him to stay, and he's scared to leave. How does he leave his mother when he was never loved by his mother? How does he become himself if he doesn't have the love foundation? That's the Furies, right? The Furies came up. Masterson calls it the abandonment depression. Yeah. So the Furies, eventually, okay, they were chasing him. He was afraid of it. The Furies, after he differentiated, served him. He accepted it. The Furies became the Eunemides meaning the centuries to his soul castle. His feelings served his inner connectedness. He was aware of his feelings. I feel, therefore I am. I feel, I have my the centuries, therefore I am. That kind of thing. So one person says, Arestia is really the true starting myth of psychoanalysis. You've got to separate from the mother. Okay, the mother complex one, yeah, that's sort of the problem. Well, where, where do we start? Well, let's start with the recognition. We got to separate from the mother. So I, I kind of like that. I like that quote about that. That Arestia is the true starting myth of psychoanalysis. We got to find a way. Right? That's what the, the the riddle is about. Can you recognize that we got to separate? else any moon here hey where's the moon shouldn't there be a moon out here somewhere okay I guess I'll um the stop button. I'm tempted to go on a little bit, but um, why don't we just uh, hit the pause button here. So thanks very much. Uh, this has been TQ 2150. So we now have 2,150 quotes to 1,001 Windmills of the Mind. And, um, So yeah, Otto Kernberg, you know, he represents some diversity in a psychoanalytic perspective. He's helpful. Uh, see, I think that's, there's a good example of accepting Otto Kernberg. It's not an either or thing. He's partly helpful. He's partly frustrating. Can you accept the two sides? I must confess in the beginning, I couldn't really. I thought, oh my God, this guy. Uh, 
he's a very guarded guy, and he's uh, very, very resistant to. Um, but why don't we accept the ambivalence of that? So what? Everybody's guard. Everybody has defense mechanisms. So he has this personality. He's traumatized. Right? And he's being helpful at the same time. So I've now developed more of a three-dimensional perspective of Otto Kernberg. Um, yeah, Robert A. Johnson says this. We want to move... He's, his summary of uh, men's development is... We want to move from two-dimensional thinking. That's the play, the Don, his example was Don Quixote, right? the playboy. To three-dimensional thinking, that's some, that's any character literature that's confused and questioning uh, three dimensional. To, to four-dimensional, that's Faust part two. So Faust part two, uh, at the end, uh, According to John, uh, Robert A. Johnson, uh, Faust Part Two represented sort of the more integrated uh, side of it, uh, a more whole uh, version. Okay, uh, one last look here. Thanks again, and uh, I'll see you in the next video. And um, we'll be adding quotes to all of our various threads. 50 threads, 50 topics, 50 chapters, e-booklets. We'll be adding quotes to all of them. And we have some threads that are undeveloped. Huh? The BPD one, that's undeveloped. Uh, we have some... Uh, possible new threads starting in the future but for the moment we have 50 threads right now and uh, maybe I do see a bit of myself in Otto Kernberg maybe I'm maybe as I learn about myself maybe I feel like I'm learning more about Otto Kernberg maybe I had a projection onto him of something I didn't accept about myself of that wounded child uh, maybe I saw that in him and maybe it was a little resistant to seeing him as credible but he, he, he's he tries to be very um, professional in his writing he tries to be very authoritative and professional and to a certain degree you feel it he's a medical doctor by the way so he's a knowledgeable guy you know I feel that way a little bit about Dreikers had that quality Burglar was a little more relaxed about it. Karen Horney offers some of the most uh, encouraging reading. A good book to read is Our Inner Conflicts by Karen Horney, one of our mentors. Okay, I'll definitely hit the pause button now. So thanks very much, see you soon.